welcome to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton. Uh, today, we're going to shift topics a little bit. We're going to talk with one of my colleagues, Dr. Linda Leerheimer, and about her research on nuns in 17th century France. Uh, so without further ado, welcome to ThinkTech. Hi. Well, thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Linda. This is your first time, right? Yeah, my first time. Okay, interesting. Be kind. <laughs> <laughs> We're always very kind. We've got glowing stained glass behind us. Oh, this perfect. should feel like like a refuge or yeah. a solace in yes. a sense. Yes. Um, so one of the things I find very interesting uh, is your research and a lot of the the classes that you teach at HBU. But normally my my tradition is to start a little bit about you yourself. Uh, a little bit about your background and why you got interested in a topic uh, that for many people will seem quite unique. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you, you know, the, the, the basic question, uh, where are you from and how did you get involved in this? Um, so where I'm from is like the hardest question anybody ever asked me. That's why we started <laughs> with it, right? <laughs> because, well, I was born in the Bay Area and then when I was two, I moved and then basically moved for the rest of my life. Okay. Um, Hawaii is the longest I've lived anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, but before that, I'd never lived anywhere more than six years in a row, so... Oh, wow, okay. Um, yeah, so that was, it was a peripatetic mm -hmm. childhood. Okay. I lived in Asia, um, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually there when Obama was there. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> For did, about the same age. <laughs> did, you, did you know Barry? N no, I think we just m missed each other. Oh, okay, but, okay. Uh, um, and then uh, I went to college in Oregon at Reed College, mm -hmm. where I majored in history. And then I went to for graduate school. I got my PhD at Princeton University. Mm -hmm. Then I got a, my first job at St. John's University College of St. Benedict in Minnesota. And then I came here, and I've been here for the last uh, well more than 15 years. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> Interesting. So, I mean, given your research in sort of religious history, uh, women's history, I mean, that's an interesting place to start teaching then, right? Yeah. So, um, it was uh, the colleges, well, the, the, these are two colleges that are that used to be single sex mm -hmm. uh, with, there's a monastery on one campus. They had two campuses like HPU, but okay. one was <laughs> where the monastery and the other campus had the convent. Mm -hmm. um, and so actually my colleagues, some, some of my colleagues were nuns, which maybe that, I think part of why they hired me was they were interested in my work. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very interesting place to be, especially teaching um, religious history. Mm -hmm. uh, the resources there, it's, the, it's one thing I miss about that place because they had amazing research sources for doing religious studies. Mm. And, um, uh, for example, I taught a course on the Reformation, and I, I was able to take my students to visit their relic collection. Oh, and wow. They had medieval relics, like a whole body of a saint okay. <laughs> in their relic, you know, in the <clears throat> basement of the church. So mm. um, it was really an interesting experience to be there. Okay. Yeah. But, so you started off uh, as an undergraduate studying in history, then you made the decision, right, to continue into graduate level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the... the You've chosen to, what got you interested both in early modern France and then looking at early church and, and religious history and some of these social history? Well, when I went to college, I thought I was going to do Asian studies, but mm -hmm. then I chose a college that didn't have that, <laughs> that uh, which yes. was kind of, uh, I, I did realize I wanted to go to a particular college and it was a choice I made. Um, and then it took me a while to find a major, but I had a, uh, some really ama amazing teachers mm -hmm. that uh, one of the first history courses I took was a course on the French Revolution, mm -hmm. and I just became enamored uh, of that period. And then I took a class um, which was a joint to team taught by an anthropologist and a historian, and this mm -hmm. was like sort of the big thing. Uh, when I was in college and graduate school was intersections between history and anthropology. Mm -hmm. So I, I became fascinated with sort of being an anthropologist of the past. Mm -hmm. And that's the, 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 my mentor was a French historian and uh, that sort of, I also knew, had been studying French since in junior high school. So. Um, that kind of it was sort of by chance. Okay, uh, interesting. I just got that was what engaged me, and mm -hmm. um, 
ever since then, I haven't looked back. <laughs> okay, interesting. I mean, one of the things that, you know, a lot of our watchers, a lot in, pop, in popular culture, I mean, we, we do have this sort of viewpoint uh, of France in the 16th and 17th century, and I mean... You have, you have a viewpoint? A viewpoint. Most people don't have a viewpoint. They don't know anything about it. So. Well, I think in well, popular Louis culture... The, Louis XIV. Right, Louis XIV, yeah. Three Musketeers, yeah. this, these sorts of things, um, films with Isabelle Jani yeah. or something. Um, but one thing that comes across is this kind of funny contrast, since you brought up Louis XIV, that the one stage, by the end of the 17th century, we've got this absolute estate, an absolute monarchy, we have a cultural, political, sort of military leader uh, of, of the Western world, but if you go back to sort of the 16th, early 17th century, we see a France that is sort of at face value, sort of torn apart by unrest. Yeah. Whether it's the religious wars in the 16th century, Huguenot rebellions, yeah. the Fronde, all those yeah. sorts of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, was that sort of the reason that sort of drew you this sort of heady period of sort of sort of conflict and unrest and change and turmoil? Was that something that drew you? Um, not really. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, although I am interested in issues of power, I'm, yeah. I'm more interested, so everybody thinks about uh, 17th century France as being the rise of the absolutist state, but I'm interested in the challenges to that and the okay. ways that absolutism didn't work, so there's a whole historical mm -hmm. debate about whether ab there was really a absolutism really ever existed. Um, and I'm interested, because I'm mostly interested in the people at the bottom and mm -hmm. how they, they um, I guess, sort of the tradi traditional societies. Mm -hmm. um, I am interested in the, in the unrest in terms of how people negotiated that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of my mentor in graduate school, Nat Natalie Zeman Davis, wrote a really seminal article about religious violence mm -hmm. and the, the, what she called the rights of violence and how um, violence was enacted during the religious wars. Mm. And those are the kinds of questions that I find really interesting. The, the, not so much the unrest, but how that, I guess, I guess it is the unrest. Mm. I mean, periods of great change are always fascinating mm. because they, they bring to the surface all sorts of things that you don't see otherwise. Right, it's an old Thomas Hardy saying, right? You yeah. know, that war is rattling good history and peace is poor reading. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not that interesting to study times where there's no nothing exciting or different going on. Right. You know? I want to pick up one, one, one word that you mentioned was sort of negotiate or negotiation. Yeah. And so a lot of people use the term sort of negotiation or brokerage for the societies mm -hmm. at this time that we have this image of sort of Louis, Louis XIV and the sort of absolute state. But in some ways, while one could argue the beginnings of bureaucracy, taxation, standing armies were happening. There still is, a, you know, this sort of milieu in which people exist, mm -hmm. which is very traditional, very yeah. medieval. And so the, the powers of the monarchy were in many ways more limited than, say, a modern democratic yeah, state. Very much so. Um, how, what's, what's, how does this maybe get into sort of where you're looking at with nuns and monasteries and That's things? That's a really good question. So, I, in early modern France, prior to the French Revolution, there are all these overlapping jurisdictions, so mm -hmm. it's really hard for the state to impose, even to like make to make anybody do anything, <laughs> because um, you have uh, local institutions, you have different types of currency, even different mm -hmm. taxations in different areas of France, different languages. Um, so one of the things that I'm interested in is well in general, how people use that in order to resist. Mm. So they use these different, uh, they can play one power against the other. Mm. So the nuns that I'm studying for a book project right now, they, um, they use, uh, there's the bishop's power, and then mm. there's the local parlement, which mm -hmm. is uh, the law courts, which, that is secular law, and then there's the, the pope in Rome, and they're using all of these different jurisdictions against one another, they all have different rules, right? Mm -hmm. So no rule necessarily trumps the other, no law necessarily. It's, there's, laws always have to be negotiated because there's all these different kinds and they don't, they often conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's something, at first when I was in graduate school I had to study all these, <laughs> I remember having to trying to memorize all the different jurisdictions in France as part of my um, general exams and it was just it was really hard, mm. but now I look back and I say, oh, well, that's what makes this so interesting. You know, once you get to the modern state, there's less of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do have things like states' rights versus national rights, but um, there's much more 
the state has an easier, you know, it's much more s straight line between the, s the state uh, um, saying what people are supposed to do. But in all these overlapping jurisdictions and in early modern Europe just make it both impossible but also fascinating. Uh, is anyway not to jump ahead, I want to stick with nuns, but I, I thought since you brought this <laughs> up, uh, I mean, does that in a sense in many ways inform this sort of revolution that happens in France, very inspired by Rousseau, about not wanting to have intervening identities and variables or factions yep. between people in the state? Yep. So there's different arguments about the French Revolution, but one of them is that it's continuing that effort by the absolutist state to try and impose the authority of the state of a single, um, you know, of a single nation, right? Mm. Where there's only one set of rules. And um, some people would say they are, that's what, it's the, it's the actually the, it's the, the success that, that the absolutist state never had. Mm. Okay, and, and also this kind of fascinating voyage in the 19th century of sort of constructing both a French state and a, and a French nation, or as yeah. you know, Eugene uh, Weber yeah, would talk true. about. That's true. Uh, um, you still have, some people would say you didn't even have that mm. until the 20th century, right? Cause, okay. Because well, Weber's thesis is that, you know, it's from, from peasants into Frenchmen, mm -hmm. and they, there were no Frenchmen right. until the 20th century. I'm not sure what where he dates that, but. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll close there in the French Revolution, come back to uh, nuns and monasteries um, <laughs> after a very short uh, series of announcements about other programs on ThinkTech. Aloha, we invite you to join us on our Keys to Success show, which is live on the ThinkTech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. My name is Danilia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Our goal for Keys to Success is to provide a platform for professional and personal development tools and profound insights on how to achieve success in life, career and or business. We have incredible guests from all walks of life, including politicians, successful business owners, leaders, entrepreneurs and authors. As this is a live show, there are live mess ups as well, which are fun to watch. Aloha and we'll see you on Thursday. Welcome to ThinkTechHawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi, your host. The topic is Asia in Reveal. We do it on a monthly basis on Thursday at 11 o'clock. Be sure to check the schedule. See you. Hello, we're back to Think Tech. Uh, we are talking with Linda Lehrheimer, talking about her research on nuns in early 17th century France. Before the break, we were talking a bit about French history, French Revolution, that stuff, but I'd like to get refocused on Linda's research. And so you've been doing a, a series of projects about uh, these nuns and how they're sort of maybe rebelling or acting against both temporal and maybe even spiritual authority. I mean, what are some of the stuff that you've been working on uh, lately? Um, so right now I'm working on a book uh, it's taking me a long time, but <laughs> <laughs> gradually it's, uh, it's emerging. Um, and it's, folk, it's a micro history where I'm looking at this one event in 16, the 1620s, 1623 in particular, uh, a conflict between nuns and their bishop. The mm -hmm. bishop tries to depose their mother superior because she, he doesn't like their choice. And they appeal to Rome, to the local courts, um, and they, they, they are successful actually mm. at that. So in my book, I'm trying to, it, it, as I was, I'm interested in nuns resisting authority and trying to establish religious, using the rules of the church to establish religious autonomy because a lot, often there are these stereotypes about, about nuns, especially um, in the past where uh, the idea was that families just, you know, sent their daughters to these monasteries and that it was they were it, it, these women were enclosed and it was repressive but in fact 
Uh, I argue that this was a sphere where they could exercise religious autonomy. Mm. Um, I have a number of cases where nuns lock out, they lock the doors and don't let the religious authorities in. <laughs> literally. You know, literally, literally lock the doors. Autonomy. You know, this is the cloister, you can't come in. Right. Um, and it's very hard for them, for like the bishop who's supposed to be in charge to resist that. Mm. But in my book, I'm trying to look at um, different than, than the nuns, the bishop, and the families of these nuns who are mostly um, lawyers and judges at the local parliament, mm -hmm. and all the different conflicts that were taking a place. It's not so much this particular event, but what it tells us about local politics, mm. uh, about the relationship between religious authorities and, and nuns, religious authorities, and secular authorities, and all like pop the family patronage too is really important because mm. the bishop supposedly is the most powerful. He's like one of the richest men in France. He's, you know, the, he's trying to reform this vast diocese, but he's an outsider and he comes in and, mm. and uh, there are all these other powers that are um, on the nun's side. So, um, mm. and the nuns are playing uh, the Pope against Okay. Uh, against <laughs> the bishop, too, because the bishops in France were appointed by the king. Mm. So there's all these... Okay, these, right. It's, it's all about these different, the, these different um, competing ty types of power, and mm. they're really ingenious at how they use that. How much, one thing just uh, that you mentioned earlier, I was curious about, how much does sort of the background uh, of the women in question who become nuns have with it? Because I, I think often that we, we tend to perhaps lose yeah. track. I mean, a, a lot of them or some of them, I don't know the percentages, mm -hmm. you know, come from sort of, you know, very wealthy, right. educated families. And so right. they were brought up to be very, you know, very literate and all these other things. I mean, does that in a sense give them like, a, I don't know, a skill set or a background in a sense to, to leverage their, their roles um, or not so much? I think it does, but I have examples of nuns who didn't have that. Okay. Who, like, I um, actually translated the memoirs of a nun. I mean, obviously she was literate, but um, she was from a peasant family mm. and did much of the same okay, thing. Okay, interesting. But the nuns I'm studying, they were definitely using their, they came from legal families, oh. <laughs> and they used the law to its fullest extent. I mean, ev all of their arguments, like they should have, and today they would all be lawyers. Right. right? <laughs> Maybe nun lawyers. Nun lawyers, right. Yeah, but they the were most able, dangerous, they right? <laughs> were brought up in that environment, and they knew how to, mm. you know, use these arguments to their benefit. One thing I was going to ask you about your, your teaching before we get to there, uh, uh, one of the questions, I, I like pop culture and I like representations mm -hmm. of history in pop culture. Um, kind of maybe a potentially difficult question for you. Is there you know, a, a book in fiction or movies or theater that maybe sort of illustrates or captures some of this, whether it's accurate or a stereotype is uh, another matter, uh, yeah. that our viewers might be you know, curious or have seen? Or? Um, not so much about nuns, but, uh, so my PhD uh, advisor, Natalie Zeman Davis, wrote a book called The Return of Martin Gare. Yes. And she also was a historical advisor on the film. It's a film, French film with, you can get it with subtitles, English mm -hmm. subtitles. And to me, that's one of the greatest historical films, mm -hmm. uh, particularly about this period that's, it's, uh, it really gives you a visual image and delves into the lives, not of the people at the top, but at the people at the bottom. And mm -hmm. it's a fun mystery because it's about a case of mistaken identity mm -hmm. that really happened in 16th century France. So uh, for me, it's not so much the topic, but the way her model of how she does history, that's what I'm striving for mm -hmm. because she's so brilliant at telling a story and uh, of using these stories to get us to think ourselves into the shoes and the heads of people in the past. Mm. Um, so for me, uh, I'm different from like wanting to make some big grand pronouncement. I want people to be able to try and, I guess, historical empathy and yep. understanding how people thought and what motivated them. That's a, that's a model for me. So a um, big thing for you sort of is contextualization, in a sense. Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. or well, even or the, the zeitgeist of the time, perhaps? Yeah, I guess. Mm. I mean, uh, one of the challenges of doing um, microhistory is how representative is it? Mm. But you can use it to tell, you know, to then connect it to other things that were happening at the time. 
And because in the period I study, there aren't that many documents. Okay. Uh, um, these are like little glimpses that, you know, you can't say everybody was like this, but if you get enough little glimpses that mm. illustrate the same point, then, um, yeah, you can make, make generalize to a, a bit. Okay. In sense. Interesting. I mean, one thing I, I hear a lot from students and from your colleagues is a lot of the innovative things that you do in the classroom, uh, from games to role play and a whole bunch of other things. I mean, how does your research, in a sense, affect uh, how you interact with students and, and do things in the classroom? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't get to teach the things, you know, the things mm -hmm. I'm researching very often, but I try and integrate the approaches, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and sometimes, I, you know, when I teach a I teach a course on the historian's craft, and I integrate a lot of um, the types of history, microhistory. Uh, I make them read a lot of French historians <laughs> because okay. that's what I I love. Um, uh, and so my that that's one way the the kind of history I do influences how I teach uh, students or history majors how about how to do history. Mm -hmm. Um, in particular, the importance of the archive and using primary sources. Um, and then when I teach the, even though the French Revolution is not really, I don't really work on that period, it's one of my passions, my mm. historical passions, is the, studying the French Revolution. And I do get to teach that class, and I have them do this. I've been having them, for the last few times I've taught the course, I've had them play a role-playing game, mm -hmm. uh, and they are members of the National Assembly oh. trying to, <laughs> to construct a constitution in the years before the, the terror. Okay. Um, and so they, uh, they take on roles, they, ha they, they, they are parts of political factions, mm -hmm. they read Rousseau, and okay. they have to use him. Uh, it's the only time I've ever got students to actually really try and grapple with the hard ideas in Rousseau. Okay. They, they really do. They come yeah. out saying, you know, <laughs> Rousseauian things, at least the people who are on that side right. uh, of the debate. So um, it's really a lot of debating, but, mm. but the work they do, it's hard. Students will do extra work because they're competing yep. to win the game and also because they get so engaged with their role that, mm. uh, that they'll, um, you know, they'll do a lot of extra work. Um, and then I've spun that off into teaching a course that where I just do historical games. And not all of those are related to my, directly to my research. Mm -hmm. um, I do a game set in ancient Athens. Okay. And well, like I've done Ming China. Or? Yeah, the, we do the trial of Socrates. Okay, interesting. <laughs> and yeah, they, have, students have to come up with interesting ideas for pig sacrifices. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, I, I, I dabble a bit with using sort of simulations in my classes, mm -hmm. and I, I find them really, um, while they are a lot of work to construct, yeah. um, I find them really profound teaching tools for really, uh, in my case, it's a little bit different, but having them thinking about making choices and how, you know, right, it's easy exactly. in hindsight, right? Yeah. Oh, well, they yeah. should have just... And they right. realize how difficult these choices were and mm. how many different possibilities there were. It really teaches students about the contingency of history. Mm. Not like what if somebody did differently, but there are so many different possible ways history can go. Mm. And, um, and individuals do have an impact on shaping it. Maybe not you know, completely, but individual decisions are important. Mm. What's one of the, the things that you've kind of learned, something surprising perhaps, in teaching students uh, uh, in these classes, something that's been interesting to you over the years? In, in my uh, simulation yeah, classes? Yeah, yeah, something you've learned uh, about students or changing generations or anything. Um, God, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a hard question. <laughs> uh, well, I've learned that students who are quiet often have a lot to say. I mean, mm. maybe that's, that's not so much like about something concrete, but um, almost every time I teach the games, there's somebody really quiet who just blossoms because they get so engaged with mm. their role that they, um, they just start naturally. Uh, I think like acting, role playing can um, give people the freedom to be people that they're not. But also I think that students start to empathize with, the, with people in the past in a mm. way. We often see them as foreign beings, especially when it's that far away, like ancient Athens. Mm. So, 
those are the lessons. <laughs> okay, interesting. Have you found this a question I've asked several several of my guests? Uh, I'm kind of uh, I'm curious about it. Have you found that given the, given that you've been teaching for some time, have you found that there's been sort of generational shifts about interests or attitudes of your students from maybe when you started teaching for today? Because this is often it's almost become like a cliche, right? That our students have moved from being historical to ahistorical to non-historical. <laughs> <laughs> right, in that sense, right? That there's less and less knowledge of yeah. history. I mean, do you find that that's the case or not? Um, yes, although I, I mean, I'm not sure there's a huge difference. Um, okay. But I do feel like historical training is at the pre collegiate level leaves a lot to de be desired. Mm -hmm. um, and students come in really having a lot of mis misconceptions or wrong knowledge about history. Um, but just to take your question in a different way, mm -hmm. um, because I do um, women's and gender history, um, at the beginning, uh, this was a really hot topic, right? And it was when I first started becoming interested, this is one of the reasons I became interested in history was because um, it was the beginning of women's history. And then for a while it became kind of uncool, like that's not really... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I kind of feel like it's having a resurgence. Uh, like I think women's issues in general and gender issues are becoming central mm. cultural issues, and I, ha I have students a lot more interested in studying history from that angle. So mm. that's a hopeful thing. I yeah, guess. <laughs> I mean, it's almost it's I, it's one of the, it's, I would I I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, it's it's a thing that's interesting that it's become instead of being sort of like a like a sort of Specialization, in a yeah. sense, it's very—I um, don't know—integral or mainstream. Yeah. I don't know the. What it's no word longer. I'm it used to be sort of ghettoized. You do women's history, mm. and now there's a place for his women's history classes, but it's more integrated into every history class. Right? Mm. I mean, you always have to address issues of you know race, gender, class. It's mm. become one of those categories of analysis, and. Um, I mean, that was always the goal, right? To, right? For women to not be just a special topic, but to be integrated into the history that everybody tells. Mm, interesting. So. And you're doing part of this role yourself. I, so. That's, what I, that's <laughs> been my goal since the beginning. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that inspired me to be a historian. So. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, fascinating conversation. That's all the time we have yeah. uh, for today on Global Connections. But thank you for joining me, Linda. Thank you. All right. And all for all my watchers out there, I'll see you again next week. We'll probably be talking more about the use of films and teaching history uh, next week. I think that's the plan. So I'll see you. Look forward to seeing you guys next week.